Well, good evening. I hope already you have been challenged and stirred, but I hope more than that, I hope you're already being changed. God tells us that's what he'll do through his word. One of the great joys that comes to me as a preacher is the fact that I can rest in the power of the word of God to do the work that God wants to do, not in the strength of my personality, because I would be in great trouble. You know, I wondered, looking at the schedule at first, as to why Pastor Whitmer would put two of us on two nights and flip. Why he wouldn't just give me an hour and a half and let me preach. And after listening to Brother Dale, I figured it out. Because you probably wouldn't come back tomorrow night to hear me, but you might come back to hear him. And so, uh, if we put the half and half, you have to come, and it's rude to walk out halfway through. So, anyway, good to see you tonight. It is my privilege Uh, to be uh, here with you. It is my joy to be here. Uh, I have followed the story of Lighthouse Baptist Church from a distance, and uh, it's a joy, actually, for me to get to be here and to see what God is doing in this place and then to get to meet uh, so many other faithful pastors laboring over here. Uh, I am in Chicago, Illinois, uh, ministering. Well, I'm not in Chicago. I'm in Schaumburg, in northwest suburbs of, of Chicago, Uh, But really, it is a first for us. I spent a few years in Detroit, uh, but I was born in Belfast, Northern Ireland, and grew up in Nova Scotia, Canada, and so most of my life has been spent uh, over this way. Uh, I have been in Schaumburg for two and a half years, but spent 11 years of my ministry ministering at Grace Baptist Church in Wilmington, North Carolina, the other Wilmington, and uh, I, I often would have people say, oh, well, I know where that, and they would be the wrong Wilmington. So uh, I live in the less famous Wilmington for a long time, and so I have enjoyed the East Coast, and I'm learning, I am learning to enjoy the Midwest. Uh, it is a learning process. Take your Bibles tonight and turn with me, uh, if you would, to the book of Second Timothy in chapter 3. Second Timothy chapter 3. Uh, God has done a marvelous thing in the New Testament in that he gives us truth and he gives it to us from different perspectives. And one of the things that we have an opportunity is to see church truth. And I appreciated so many of the things that that, uh, Pastor Gooding said and in particular as he was closing uh, his message with regard to an emphasis on the church. In a sense, what God did is he gave us an epistle that really is to the, to, to the church. It's an epistle that is about the church. It is that epistle to the church at Ephesus, which, by the way, I think was a place, ministry-wise, that Paul saw as a model church. He spent more time there than he did in any other place. And thus, he demonstrates incredible concern, not just for that church, but for the church in general as it would look to the model at Ephesus. And then he does another thing. He gives us to what we know as pastoral epistles, which really are truth to that same church, only they're communicated to that church through the role of their pastor. Now, I don't know that Timothy, per se, was exactly what you and I would view today as a pastor, though he functioned as the proclaimer of truth at Ephesus. He really was still more of uh, an apostolic um, appointee. He was there by Paul's appointing rather than what you and I would understand as the means by which a church calls a pastor, yet he is functioning in a different role than an apostle, and thus we find him functioning in the role of a shepherd, pastor, teacher at this church. And so as we get all the truth that comes to Timothy through 1 Timothy and 2 Timothy about how he should then guide the church at Ephesus to be the pillar and ground of the truth, and we couple that with the truth that is given uh, in the epistle of uh, of, of Ephesians, it is interesting to see all the truth that we get about the church. I actually, tonight and tomorrow night, I'm going to take this entire passage in 2 Timothy chapter 3. I'll start in verse 10. We're actually going to go all the way through chapter 4 and verse 5, and we'll break it into two messages. But I want us to understand exactly what it is this dying apostle, by the time we get into 2 Timothy, is going to communicate about the transmission of truth and its essential place for a healthy church. So let me capture the whole. I I agree with with, uh, Brother Dale. Uh, It is hard to preach expositionally uh, and do it in one message. You can exposit a text, 
But if you come to a text, one of the things, by the way, if you, you might want to write this down. It's, not, it's just simple. But one of the things I always do when I come to a text is hermeneutically, I approach that text, that text and I ask some questions. Who wrote it? Who did he write it to? Why did he write it to them? What does that mean to them? Now, what does it mean to me? So who wrote it? Who did he write it to? Why did he write it to them? What did it mean to them? Now, what does that mean to me? By the way, that is the right process of getting to the right application of a text. Because God will never give us truth in the word of God that comes to mean something that it never meant. And so while there are varying applications of a text, there is only one meaning, and that is authorial intent. What did the author mean? So who wrote it? Who did he write it to? Why did he write it to them? What did it mean to them? Now, what does that mean to me? How do I apply that to my life? Well, setting the context of church truth, if you will, let me walk you through the Bible in a minute and a half. I just did myself a great injustice because I'll take about five verses in the rest of the time that I have, but I'll do the whole Bible in a minute and a half. This is important because it it actually is going to help us understand and I think then understand the gravity of this text. What is God after? Have you ever asked yourself that question? Why did God create the world? You know, it wasn't just one day that God got tired of the stuff that God did before there was time and decided, you know, maybe I'll, maybe I'll make something today. Why? Have you ever asked, why? why? Why did God create? What was God doing? What was God after? So in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And then we have this series that describes for us that creative act, and it's broken down for us into days. And at the end of each day, God said, it is, it is. It is, it is good. He gets to the last day and he says it's very good. But God in the midst of creating that environment, if you will, a splendorous, wondrous, glory reflecting environment now creates man. And when he creates man, he makes him different than all the rest of creation. He makes him from the dirt of the ground and he forms him and he breathes into his nostrils the breath of life. And man becomes a living nephesh, a living soul, a being that God described in a unique way. He said, let us create man in our own what? Anybody know what an image is? You see, we have ideas of images, right? There's those things that most often show up on Facebook. Facebook's wonderful. My parents live in Canada. My wife's parents live outside of Lansdale, Pennsylvania, and they keep up daily with what is going on with my four daughters. It's wonderful that way. They don't miss an event with it because, and, and, and they rarely, rarely get to be there. But we don't understand maybe the, the understanding in, in, the, in the Near East, if you will, in that culture of what it meant to be an image. When a ruler had a territory, and they had a territory. They didn't have the luxury of just rolling out a map of their territory and saying, here's where I rule. So you know what they would do? They actually had sculptors who would come in and carefully make sculptures of their image. They would carry those images out to the outer bounds of their territory, and so as I crossed into a territory, I would encounter an image an image that told me who was reigning in that territory. And God said, I am going to make man in my image. He intentionally created a being to be his image bearer. A demonstration of the creative power and authority of all things by God. Thus, now we begin to comprehend not just the creation, but the fall. Man falls into sin. He rebels against the authority of God. And as such, the image of God in man is not lost. It is marred. It is distorted. It is twisted. And so God now, if you will, moving from creation to fall, now begins the process of what you and I know as redemption. The first part of that saga we heard some of tonight is Israel. And Israel was a fruitless tree. 
But understand what God is doing. God now comes and he gives a people that he has chosen to bear his likeness to a watching world. That's why these are called the people of God. They are to be corporately a people who bear the image of God to a watching world. And in order for the world to understand who God is, what God is like, and God's authority, God gives to these people a law. And if they live under that law, they will demonstrate to a watching world what it looks like to live under the authority of this creator God. The problem being they were fallen and they could not keep that law and they could not demonstrate the authority of that God. Hear me, that law was never intended to be redemptive in purpose. It could not save them. It was to demonstrate their need of salvation. What happens? We heard tonight of one one who came, who wasn't just an image bearer. Paul describes him, in fact, as the exact image of the Father, an exact imprint of God himself. He lives then under that law perfectly. He keeps it. He demonstrates in his life and in his ministry completely, exactly what it looks like to live under the authority of God. When people saw him, they saw exactly what it looked like to live as God would have us to live. And then he died. And he died an atoning, substitutionary death. We sang tonight of propitiation, a satisfaction of the just wrath of God. Not because of his own sin, but he became a sin bearer, yours and mine. And he pays the atoning price for our redemption, for us to be forgiven. Now listen, we place faith and trust in him, unreserved faith in him as Savior and Lord, and we now are converted. When we are saved, what is it that God is about doing in our lives? He is about now restoring in us his own image. We are being changed from glory to glory. We are being transformed into the likeness of Christ. Salvation in its sanctification process is about restoring in us the image of God so that as we live, we demonstrate what it looks like to live in obedience to the creator God and his authority. But I want you to hear one more thing. Because God is not just after individuals. Hear me. Salvation is not just about a pitying God giving you a one-way ticket out of hell. In fact, it is totally in keeping with the purpose of God from creation. God is looking for a people who will be his image bearers to a watching world that will demonstrate in community what it looks like to live under the authority of Almighty God. That is why this is the church age. God intentionally, intentionally, by design, is building his church in this age as a redeemed people of God, called out ecclesia for a purpose so that a watching world will look into that body and see what it looks like to live under the authority of Almighty God. Do you realize that this is why whenever there's such disputing and fighting and carnality within the church, it is disgusting. I use that word intentionally. It is totally contrary, just like the fall was totally contrary to the creative purposes of God. There are over 40 one another's in the New Testament describing body relationships within the church so that we would demonstrate what it looks like to rightly honor the authority of the creator God. Hear me, God isn't playing games with the church and neither should we. This is why I say to you without any apology, you will find no such thing as an unchurched believer in the New Testament. You won't find one. Because the design of God within this age is not just believers, it's believers in community. And that community is by his creative design intentionally to demonstrate that he has a people called out for his name who will show what it looks like to live under his creative authority. 
And praise God, if you read the rest of the story, you'll see the next phase is consummation. And he will have his way. All that being said, if you'll think just for a moment of what it meant to lo- demonstrate in the Old Testament, what it looked like to live under that authority, it was the law. I don't want you to go too far with the illustration, but there is a means by which God intends for you and me within the church to understand what it looks like to live under his authority in this age. And I would say to you, it is the word of God. It is not the word of man. It is not the skillfully crafted messages of those who would get up and display to you their incredible ability in language and vernacular or well-crafted illustrations. It is the Word of God. That's what God is using in this age in the church to bring about a body that rightly demonstrates His authority. God will use His Word to do that work by the power of the Holy Spirit in the lives of individual believers and in the lives of local congregations to transform them so that a watching world says, I see God there. That's a long illustration. But all that being said, it brings us to why this is so important in the mind and in the heart of the Apostle Paul who was the apostle to the Gentiles and in a sense the apostle who was unveiling to us the church. And so understand, when he comes then to 2 Timothy chapter 3, and he's writing to Timothy, knowing he's going to lay aside his tent, and Timothy is going to carry on now this work of the church, you begin to understand why he says what he says. So you follow along as I read in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 10. But thou hast fully known my doctrine, manner of life, purpose, faith, long-suffering, charity, patience, persecutions, afflictions. You know what? He wasn't just making a case here. He wasn't just going on and on and on with adjectives to somehow help Timothy get the point. He was saying, Timothy, you really did know all this stuff. Which came unto me at Antioch, at Iconium, at Lystra, what persecutions I endured, but out of them all the Lord delivered me. Yea, and all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. But evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. But continue thou in the things which thou hast learned and hast been assured of, knowing of whom thou hast learned them. And that from a child thou hast known the holy scriptures, which are able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, truly furnished unto all good Let's begin to unpack this. In its setting, Paul has just finished encouraging Timothy, challenging Timothy about the times in which he lives. And the fact that there are going to be apostates. And those apostates are going to, by design, by design, intentionally try to penetrate, invade the church. It's going to happen. And thus, as he comes to this passage of Scripture, he is going to speak to him as one who will be teaching the church how he is to withstand apostasy. And in fact, he's going to tell him the means to withstand apostasy. And that really is the flavor of what is taking place in this passage of Scripture. Timothy is to lead the church in Ephesus to withstand the inroads of apostate teachers by providing them with a personal example of godliness. And by proclaiming the means of that godliness. And so tonight I want us to look at the value of a living example. The value of a living example. Somebody once told me this. You will learn in your ministry that if you communicate from your head, you may change somebody's mind. If you communicate from your heart, you might change their attitudes. But if you communicate from your life, you have the potential of changing someone's life. 
Spurgeon said something similar, only he said it this way. Whatever calling a man might pretend to have, if he does not have a call to purity, he certainly does not have a call to the ministry. Paul's writing to Timothy and he says, you know what, Timothy, I'm writing to you and I'm not writing to you to say I'm perfect. That's not the point. I'm not even writing to you to say I'm the model. But I'm writing to you because at the end of my life, I want you to understand the importance of you living what you claim. In other words, I want your life to substantiate the life-giving truth that you're proclaiming. Sounds an awful lot like a fruitless, feigned tree, doesn't it? And so what he does is in showing the value of a living example, he says first that there are character qualities that go with that. And I want you to see them in verse 10. But thou hast fully known my doctrine. And he says this, Timothy, you will communicate the power of the word of God to change a life in your life through your preaching, our doctrine. The word is our teaching, that which we believe. Remember when Paul first visited Timothy's home city? He preached with such power that the people there thought he was a god. He had to correct them and tell them he wasn't a god. But Timothy was there and Timothy got to see that. And then Timothy had the privilege of traveling and watching Paul in all different settings with all different kinds of audience declare one message about one Messiah. And he watched that preaching make a difference everywhere. You see, the reality of it is we communicate through our preaching. We as preachers need to remember that, and I think that's why there's an urgency for us to understand expositional preaching, which is the theme of this conference. But I wonder tonight, if you are going to a world as one who is a keruk, a declarer of truth, one who is a messenger of the king, one who is the one who is going to call out just the king's message, I wonder, are you doing that? It'd be really easy for us to stay here and have a, a conference about expositional preaching and say, boy, this is what we've got to do, and this is the way it has to be done. And, and as a result of that, we can point fingers at those who aren't doing it. But at some point, we've got to declare the message of the king. Are you a herald? Are you actually declaring his message? Boy, in the marketplace of the ideas that is swirling all around us today, it becomes harder and harder and harder to get the confidence to declare that message. But the reality of it is the message hasn't changed. Paul preached it in all various kinds of marketplaces, but he preached the same message, the same Lord. We'll communicate through our preaching, but that's not the only place. You also see in verse 10 that he says, you have fully known my doctrine and manner of life. We communicate through our practice. We communicate through our practice, our manner of life. The only Christ I have ever seen is the Christ that I see in the Word of God and the Christ I see reflected in the lives of other people. Oh, how I wish I had the privilege of actually looking at Him, and one day I will. But I can't until He comes again. And so for me and for you humanly, I'm only able to see Christ in two ways. One, I see Him in the living Word of God, and I see that living Savior reflected in the lives of those He's transforming. What is your life saying about your Lord? Oh, when I think of what ministry looks like today and the shambles that so many ministers have made of ministry, it must be heartbreaking to Almighty God. So many of us, though we may not be television preachers, but so many of us somehow manage in the day-to-day -day stuff of life to make ministry about us. Do you realize that that's why so many of us get depressed? Why'd they have to say that? Why'd they have to do that? Why are they thinking that? And we live with fear of man all the time. And the reality of it is the reason we do that is because it's so easy to make ministry about us. And it's not about us. The church is not about us. The church is not about our opinion and the color of the carpet. The church is not about our control of the budget. It's not about our ministry design ideas. The church is about Jesus Christ. And our manner of life declares not just what we preach. It declares who we think ministry is all about. What does your manner of life declare? That your life is all about. 
But thirdly, I want you to see we communicate then through our purpose. Our life's purpose is whatever we would die for right now. That's a simple way of putting it. What is your purpose? When people see us living with a sense of Christian purpose, it ought to inspire them toward Christ. What is our purpose? What what are we after anyway? You know, a great way to come to grips with that is what we think is normal. So let me explain that just for a moment. Have you ever had something go wrong that you weren't expecting? Probably today, but, but yeah, that happens to us, right? And your response to that is, this just isn't right. And you know what we have declared? That we believe if things are right, we live in a perfect world. This isn't the way it should be. Maybe you found yourself there in prayer. I've been there. God, this just isn't the way it should be. And we have this impression in our mind that if we do thus and so, life is going to be thornless roses. That there won't be any problems in life. That there there won't be any trials in life. I, I, I want you to understand that that is actually exactly the opposite of what Jesus said. In this life, you will have persecution. Peter said, don't think it's strange when you find yourself in fiery trials. James, at the beginning of of James chapter one, says it's normal to find yourself in multifaceted trials. In fact, the Bible tells us that God actually has purpose in those trials for the trying of our faith brings endurance. It works patience. So often our life becomes about Finding a way to live without difficulties. And the reality of it is, that is not God's purpose for your life. It is through the difficulties of life to demonstrate the authority of God in your life. Whenever I find myself moping and whining and having a pity party, I am not demonstrating to the world the authority of God. What is my purpose? Then notice again verse 10. He uses the word faith. We communicate through our perseverance. The word faith here means being faithful under pressure or fidelity. It influences people who see our doctrine to sustain us during difficult days. What I believe is actually impacts my life that I keep on living consistently what I claim to believe when things aren't easy. We don't abandon it. We don't abandon ourselves to despair. We persevere because of the promise of God. We communicate through our patience with circumstances. But then I want to give you the next one. Notice what he says. That we have seen his long suffering. Timothy had seen his long suffering. Thus his perseverance and his patience. And this may be the more difficult one because perseverance is the ability to remain faithful in difficult circumstances. And this one is the ability to remain faithful in spite of difficult people. Someone wisely said, I think, The test of a man's character is what it takes to stop him. But you know, the reality of it is, many of us as believers don't actually stop. But an awful lot of us change. Due to the circumstances we face, and the reality of it is, in encountering those circumstances, difficult people or difficult things, they didn't go the way that I wanted them to go. You know what we end up doing? We end up robbing the Lord of His glory because we become less faithful to His church. Well, I'll just, okay then. And I won't be as involved. I won't buy in quite as much. I won't give quite as much. I'm not going to do quite as much. I'm not leaving. I'm not quitting. But the reality of it is, I, I am going to be changed. By the way, if that's my response within a community of faith, 
who am I really acknowledging to be the Lord of that community of faith? Am I not somehow then in a means acknowledging that somebody else is in control and I'm backing off because they offended me? I'm going to give a little less because that person didn't do it the way I wanted to. I'm going to be a little less faithful because those people treated me a little differently than I wanted to be treated. I'm not going to be as in whatever that is because my program didn't get the emphasis I thought it should get or whatever it might be. Am I not somehow saying Jesus really isn't Lord here because he hasn't done anything, has he, for you to be less faithful? We communicate through our philanthropy, if you will. He uses the word love, charity. You see, Paul had a life where when Timothy watched his life, there was no question that Paul was both a God lover and a good lover. He was a lover of God and a lover of both good men and good things. He seized opportunities to do good to those around him, reaching them with the good things of God to demonstrate that God is good. Who have you intentionally, recently, within the community of faith, done something for just solely for the purpose of them realizing that God is good? Not even just for your own relationship with them, but just so they would be reminded that God is is good do you realize that within a community god intends to demonstrate his love to others through us realize what is the heart cry of a minister here's what it ought to be god would you accomplish your will in someone's life today and if you would please use me to do it it's that simple god would you accomplish your will in someone's life today and if you would please use me to do it now be careful, that may not be an easy prayer, and God answers it. But the reality of it is, what you've done is put yourself in the place of being a channel. You said, God, I want you to demonstrate your goodness in someone else's life, and I want that demonstration to come through me. God lover and a good lover, we demonstrate our message, we communicate our message through our philanthropy. Verse 11, we communicate through our persecutions. Paul talks about the persecutions that he faced. The record of Paul's persecutions is given in the book of Acts and 2 Corinthians. And we may not be stoned and whipped as Paul was, but we'll suffer rejection or abuse because of our commitment to Christ. The reality of it is, Paul did and we will live in a gospel-hostile world. And if we live life in ministry with the thought that God's will for us is the path of least resistance, we'll find ourselves living, not doing ministry. We are called to do ministry in a gospel-hostile world. Why? Because God's design is to show that world through the church what it looks like to live under the authority of God. And so we are to keep on sharing the gospel anyway. And when we do, the gospel message begins to cut through the fog like a spotlight. Paul says, I didn't minister just in spite of my persecutions. They became the means of me fully putting the gospel on display. Then we've communicated through our pain. He says, afflictions. Paul explained in 2 Corinthians 4, 7 that he possessed a treasure of the ministry in a jar of clay that the excellence might be of God. And during times of pain and pressure and stress, we have the greatest opportunities to let people know that Christianity is real. We communicate through our pain. And so I want you to see that, first of all, Paul says that there is value in a living example and that value is found in character qualities and he lays them out that way for Timothy. You saw this in me. But then I want you to see the conflict. The conflict. Notice what he says as I wrap this up. Yea, and all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution, but evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. Notice the conflict, the what. There's a dynamic comparison 
Verse 12 states the fact that all who will endeavor to live a godly life will suffer persecution. That's the reality. But I want you to understand the why. Why is that true? And verses 13 and 14 tell us. Verse 13 literally says that evil men will go from bad to worse, deceiving and being deceived. And rather than just describing a state of being, it is actually describing a process. Without moorings or anchors, there is a constant drift in the life of evil men. And that continual drift is the plague of relativity. There are no established moral absolutes. Pragmatism becomes the rule of the day. Do whatever works at the moment. And the only time that becomes a problem is when it is thrown against the backdrop of a moral absolute. When someone brings to light an absolute standard that has been violated or a law that has been broken, now there's a problem. Verse 14 literally says, But you, in contrast to them, remain grounded in the things which you have learned and become convinced about knowing whom you have learned them from. Timothy was being called to live out the absolutes of Scripture in the face of a culture that was declining due to having no absolutes. Does that sound familiar to you? Hear me, friends, God has not designed this age for us merely to have church membership. God has designed the church in the midst of a hostile world that says there is no absolute authority, that we would live as a community of faith in a real life with real hurts and real harm and say the gospel matters. And it looks like this. People can love each other. People can defer to each other. People can look every man on the things of others rather than on their own things. People can reflect the image of God by saying you first, not me first. By saying I will defer to you. I'll demonstrate love to you. I will live in harmony with you. I will encourage you. I will exhort you. I will edify you. I will pray for you. I will love you. And the world knows nothing of that. But that is the transforming power of the gospel in the life of a believer that is put on display when they then choose to live in community with other believers in a called out assembly called the church. And I'm here to tell you tonight, God is looking in on his church. And the world is looking on at the church. And I wonder, are they seeing image bearers? Because we are living like our creator God because we're pursuing obedience to his word that we demonstrate in relationship with one another. Can you now see the value of a godly example? It wasn't just a means of encouraging another young man to live for God. It was actually what he is saying is, Timothy, I'm telling you these things because this is what real faith looks like in a real life lived in a real community of believers. The world is going to be hostile because they are going to move more and more and more away from the moorings of the absolute authority of God. And the church is called to demonstrate that his authority is real and that his truth matters. And the only place the watching world will ever see God is by looking into the church. You saw it in me. You continue in the things you saw in me. And what we're going to see when we come back to this passage tomorrow night is that God has given us a breathed out word which is written down so that we might teach it within the church so that they might become examples as Timothy was to be and as Paul was to Timothy. I wonder tonight, is God's territory clearly marked at your church as a place where his authority is supreme? Because as he looks in, he sees you 
reflecting him. That's his design. If not, tonight, I invite you to humble your heart. Say, oh God, I've missed the purpose. I've missed the whole point. But tonight, God, I want to be your image bearer. And I want to reflect what that looks like in relationships with other believers in light of your word within your church for your glory. Let's pray.